so worried and scared that you don't want me, that you don't desire me, that maybe you don't even love me anymore. Well, that's not true. I do. I love you, Betty. I desire you. Uh, I, I, we're here because I desire you. Because I miss you. <sighs> I'd like to fornicate. Welcome back to the official Love and Death podcast. I'm your host, Nancy Miller. The second episode of the series is called Encounters. And in today's podcast, we'll have our own encounter with Lily Rabe and Jesse Plemons, who play Betty and Alan Gore. They're here to help us understand what's Betty and Alan's deal. We'll also hear from series production designer Suzuki Ingerslev, whose team did more than build a set. They created a world with subtle clues around the story. And what's it like to have your house become the perfect location for the seemingly perfect Candy Montgomery? Texas Monthly writer Sean O'Neill reveals all, including a few fun details you don't want to miss. But first, let's meet the Gores, Jesse Plemons and Lily Rabe. Thank you both, Jesse Plemons, Lily Hello. Rabe, for joining me on the second episode of the Love and Death podcast. And we are at an interesting juncture with our two characters, right? We have Alan and Betty who are going on this journey, marriage encounter. But before all of that, I would love to know about Betty and Alan as a couple before this all gets started. I think something that, that I love talking about when I talk about the two of them is that they're from Kansas. Mm -hmm. they're, so their whole love story, you know, the, the story, the, the show, and yeah. it's so Texan, and we're in Texas, and it is this small town, and it's people who've known each other forever and grown up together, and that's such a big part of the fabric of the place and of the story um, and the sort of fallout when, when things happen in small towns. But they are actually these outsiders. Yeah. Um, we were in episode two for this podcast, but in episode one, we know right away that Betty Gore is not some little shrinking violet that we might expect when we think about the, you know, unfortunate victim in a true crime drama. She has a really specific point of view. Yes. So let's talk about how you brought that little I think that's a great way to, because to me, the, that moment and all of the many subsequent moments um, that could possibly fall into that category are not at Candy. I don't think there's a sort of... Um, to me, it's not that she's competitive with Candy. I think she really thinks of Candy as her friend. I think it's all to do with, with her and how she moves through the world. And, uh, I, you know, there is a real storm for her that she is skating <laughs> like I, I just think of it as like quicksand that she's oh, yeah she's on she's on top of it as best she can be and then it just pulls her under in these moments and that's a sort of benign moment um but I you know I I I think when she points her like laser weapon at someone. <laughs> yeah. It's not That's scary. It's not <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, says says the says Jesse the man who's playing Alan. But here's the thing it's all to do with her own pain. It's but, and, and, and a sense <clears throat> of justice. What I yes. what, she's a school teacher. Like academia is a real part of their lives and um and I think you know Betty really is the exception when she, because she's she she's got a career she's going to work every day she wants to be a mother and you know that thing about how she's timing the pregnancy <laughs> <laughs> which could be you know it could it, it's it's not just about her fertility window she wants to have the baby in the summer so she doesn't have to miss work. That's that's a really, really important detail to remember when you're trying to understand Betty Gore. She's not a total control freak. She's actually got this work ethic who of someone who's like, I don't want to miss school Yeah, uh, because I, I have a job to do. Yes. So, Jesse, tell us what it was about the character of Alan Gore and his relationship with Betty that drew you to him. I 
loved Alan, um, was was as perplexed by him as I'm guessing a lot of people will be uh, yeah. for a long time. But the one thing Lily and I kept going back to was that, you know, we felt like, and it's in the book, there was a very strong bond partnership there. And I think as can happen in life with relationships, slowly over time, the relationship sort of took the back seat. Life, mm-hmm. work took sort of over all of the focus. And before they knew it, it was like they, they, they had sort of become become strangers in, in a way or just had completely lost their ability to communicate with one another. And also, you know, we talked a lot about that time and just communication in general, true yeah. communication in general was, was so was so different than, you know, um, not like Alan was like a man's man necessarily, but he was, st- he was, you know, he's still a man at that time in the South. And I think they were both desperately trying to find each other again and it just uh it just wasn't happening and we we were so um we talked about this from the first moment until through shooting their whole relationship it was always it was always about the connection and not about the disconnection i mm-hmm. think uh-huh, uh-huh. because we believed that the nucleus of the relationship mm-hmm. was real mm-hmm. and based on a true bond and that as they reconnect through the story, that is all real too and and it doesn't sort of end. Right. When the story starts, he's just frozen, I think very, very lonely and yeah. tired of feeling like he can't get it right. <laughs> he just can't get anything right. Because of the time and also because of the place, because of who they were, because of what they had access to, they didn't have the tools to help one another and so mm-hmm. they just kept further and further isolating but actually i think what her pain leads her to do which is let's say become more confrontational or more overbearing and what his pain leads him to do which is maybe then withdraw withdraw or yeah. paralyze it, it it's 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 separating them mm-hmm. but actually if they had if they had better tools, I think they could have sort of reached across that and connected. And I think it's helpful for people to understand with Betty Gore in particular that growing up, she was the one who was going to be the one that was like too big to be contained in Kansas. Yes, she ha- she was like a golden girl. She had this smile. She was that people talked about in the Valentines and the and I think she was and and back to her kind of ambition for herself, um, both as in her career and for the with the man that you know for the man that she falls in love with she falls in love with her teacher um which is a kind of wonderful thing in this instance it wasn't like scandalous yeah. um and wanting to have a family and wanting to also have a career and moving to this new town and wanting to find her place and i think that based on what i can gather from the timeline of things i think there were probably Things that were happening with her chemistry where had she had a little bit of support, and I don't even mean medication. I don't. There are so many different ways to give someone the tools to navigate yeah. that. But I think the bottom fell out and sh- it just kept falling. Like she just needed something that would have helped the floor. Stay put. <laughs> stay put. Yeah. And then I think she she could have kept her footing in it in a slightly different way. So I really think it it all has to do with that and a sort of navigation of of pain uh, and and a and a real loneliness and a real restlessness that leads to her feeling very unsafe in the world. But in episode two, there's this really striking moment then t- to understand when you're in bed together, you guys are in bed together. And Betty does this, like, red fingernail, like, shoulder tap onto Alan oh, to yeah. initiate this moment of romance. But she's rejected because Alan's too busy with candy. He doesn't have the oomph. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just, just really tired tonight. 
nein. Don't touch me. Hey, honey. You think I don't know that you're not attracted to me anymore, that you don't want to touch me, you don't want to that, touch me? That, that's not fair. That's not true. We're going to have a discussion about fair, Alan. Why don't you start? She gets absolute uh, confirmation that she should stay in that place of fear. Yeah. Oh, God, I felt like a real piece of <laughs> piece of shite. What do you mean? I mean, that just, well, it was so, I mean, we didn't do that many takes, but it was just very, very heartbreaking, um, you know, once we had cut to... You know, obviously you're, you're playing the scene when it's happening, but you could just everything she just said sort of came across in that in that moment. She feels like she's going to be, whether literally or figuratively, abandoned by this person, and that he doesn't maybe love her anymore. And then to sort of reach across the abyss with her, whatever, her, her, red, her red fingernails that give her an extra couple of inches to reach him. Mm -hmm. And then he rejects her. I think it also, because of her hypervigilance, you know, there is that, um, and, and hypervigilance and paranoia are like so, God, I could talk about that for, I'm so fascinated by that mm -hmm. because it can so easily, these things are, they're all like right on the edge where you can say, well, she's so paranoid. No, she's not. He's having an affair. Oh, everything, everything. She can't name it, but she knows something is wrong and she's right. And there is nothing worse than that oh God, to know right. the truth of something and have someone saying, no, the sky is purple. And you're like, it's blue, it's blue. And the, the, the person that you love is like, it's purple. Do you think she noticed a difference in Alan or no? When it started? Yeah. Or was it just kind of an overall sense of something being off? It's like the, the doorway had already been built before the affair, and then he just steps through it. Yeah. So that feeling of like... I think something is going to happen that is going to threaten my safety in this relationship, but also just in the world, was there. And then it's like the feeling of him just being further away as opposed to all of a sudden there's this new person. Yeah, that makes sense. It was like a, just a continuation of the thing that had already started. Jesse and Lily, I feel like we've had a real breakthrough. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> There was a lot to admire about Alan and a lot that, you know, like Lily said, Betty is so far from her. There was there was a lot with Alan that, you know, it was exciting to explore because it just, I could probably use some of, some of Alan's meticulousness <laughs> and tidiness and all of that. I don't know if I picked any of that up by playing him or not, but... Um, <laughs> But yeah, I I just I'm I'm constantly drawn to characters that that don't quickly or easily reveal themselves and um he was one of the one of the more interesting characters in that regard that I've ever played and and I also really loved the way I kind of the way I kind of looked at the early episodes where we meet Alan once the affair starts and everything is and it was a lot. A lot of it had to do with the conversations we had with Leslie, where you know, as you mentioned, the women's lib, and you know, times were really, really changing. But in these small suburban towns, they were almost a, f a few decades behind. Yeah. So they didn't really get to ride any of that, you know, f yeah. free love, uh, women's liberation. Uh, th that sort of just passed right over them. And so there was something. You know, he's a grown man with a family, but something so innocent and kind of stunted in a way. And so, the way I looked at at that affair was it 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 felt so much like a sort of high school fling infatuation where yeah. 
you know, you talk on the phone for hours, and it was really more of a, 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 a space where that was allowed, you know, more than anything. But, yeah, I was really interested in this sort of late coming into his own in, in a way, which, again, you know, is, is so sad because I think once the affair has ended and they've gone to marriage encounter, I think, you know, sounds strange to say, but it's the way that I looked at it. Um, is I think, yeah, the, the counseling, they, they could not have reached a place where it would have worked without that. I feel like the aspiration for more, though, is also, it is kind of across all of the characters in a wonderful way in yeah. the show. Um, and it ta- it takes, it it's very different path for everyone. But anyway, just as you were saying that, I think that's something that um, it is there. And it's such a, uh, listen, it's very human, but it's also, I think, very tied to the time period. And that kind of like restlessness and when they go to marriage encounter and they sort of have this real change and it's like it's a it's a pretty major thing in a relationship to to take a big turn like that and definitely and um and then like betty gets She's like all about marriage encounter, and she's you know there's agency there, I guess she's a flame leader she and it's <laughs> I, it's it's real um we we are forced to confront a complicated portrait of two women of marriages of life, and it's brilliantly rendered by you so um that's performance is everything with these things, so thank you for that I agree with, <laughs> I agree with you 100%. and um it seems like actors would spend a lot of time building chemistry. It's like really important that a couple on screen connects and you clearly you guys were texting each other, you developed a relationship and a sense of simpatico in order to bring this couple to life. How do you then create anti-chemistry? Like how does matter become anti-matter? I, I think it's somehow one and the same. I don't it, like if if one works, I feel like the other works just as well. I don't know why, but it just mm. Seems like that. You know, chem- I'm I'm always I've always kind of scratched my head about the chemistry thing, like because sometimes when you're up for a job, you'll have like a chemistry read, mm. um, which we didn't have. But I, I do... oh, you mean when they put two actors together yeah, like, to that's see a, like how you yeah, that's a thing. Like mm. oh, it's between you and the other person. They're gonna have like you read together and see who has the best chemistry. But I I really maybe this is you think it's fake. <laughs> I think what I think is fake is that. Like, I just believe that two good, good actors. actors can always have chemistry. Like, there's always something to fall in love with. There's always something to um, to 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 conflict with. There's, like, it, it's just, it can always be mined. Sometimes it's like an embarrassment of riches. But I just believe it can always That I am 100% on board with. But as someone who watched, like, some excruciating slow thrusting of Jesse of Ellen with with Betty on these screens. This is anti chemistry. It's totally so awkward. So how do you do that? Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. wow. That, but it's but it's like you have in order Should've to have seen do the that, outtakes from that day. Uh, yeah, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> like when you're moving that slowly, how long? Do, how many takes do you have to do? I really we probably, like, that was our. We probably had to do more takes of that scene than any other scene because we weren't really. My hair was falling in the wrong spot. It was. But we. It was because of how <laughs> comfortable we felt with each other. Um, we were it was just enjoying hard to ourselves laugh. a little too much, like maybe weeping. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for joining me on the Love and Death podcast as thank we you so much. as we look ahead for what's going to happen to both of these characters and. I don't know. Maybe enjoy seeing Alan squirm a little um, as he tries to negotiate these two women. They're trying, though. Like, they're trying. I think that, you know, it's like there's all these, I don't know, just there's like lots of moments of of hope, too. That's nice. Hope and squirming. (laughs) I just am trying to be. Jesse Clemens, Lily Rape, thank you so much. (laughs) And we'll still be here discussing hope and squirms um, (laughs) as we go go into the next episode. No, thank you. Thank you so much. It's my sincere pleasure. Production designer Suzuki Ingersliv had to do more than create a vintage vibe for this show. 
she and her team had to track down exact real life details for this real life true crime saga. Every single object you see on screen was handpicked to say something, down to the tacky motel bedspreads and kitschy owl lamp. For more on what to look out for and what it all means, here's Suzuki Ingerslev. Suzuki Ingerslev, thank you for joining us on the podcast. All right, so here we are. We are on the second episode of the Love and Death series and podcast. And I'm not going to spoil what happens for the audience, but I think for this series, understanding how much atmosphere, where you're from, where you live, what you do every day, and how that informs the characters is a really important detail in this show. What's the first step? First step was really getting to know the story. Mm -hmm. So I read that Texas Monthly article several times. I actually wrote down a lot of the notes because there's a lot of description in there of kind of how the crime scene was. And mm -hmm. it was really important to us. Like Leslie always said, we're not doing a documentary, but we did want to get it right to the best of our abilities. Mm -hmm. And so I started off with like a huge list for my crew of like, you know, this is what the crime scene looked like. This is what the vibe was. And then I read the book and I just wanted to understand, you know, the difference between Betty and Candy and how this even came about. So lots of research for sure. And the first thing that struck me is the end of episode two where Candy has been, is, is realizing that maybe this not so torrid affair that she has going with Alan isn't quite going to have the longevity that maybe she'd hoped. And she's standing in this perfectly 70s kitchen and she's got the meat grinder with the meat going through it in this, in this way that I find staggeringly ominous. So tell me about a scene like that. Is that something that's written in the script or she's at the meat grinder? Or is that something that you, the production designer, introduce as, a, as an opportunity for creative flourish? I'd love to take credit for that one, but that was actually <laughs> scripted and we were able to find an old meat grinder. But I find that um, all of Candy's frustration or sexual frustration or depression is taken out in the kitchen. So I feel like she's always baking. She's always cooking. She's like that happy homemaker that underneath it all is very unhappy. But you know, to the world, you know, it was important to present like how normal the family seemed. And when we started designing this, um, it was really important to understand the aesthetics of both Candy and Betty. Mm -hmm. And they're very, very different. But in the end, they both portray kind of a depression, a vastness, a loneliness inside their homes, just in a different way. So what are the subtle differences in decor between Candy's house and Betty's house? Well, I feel like with Candy, we started off as she was an interior designer. So she was kind of the cutting edge, the really, you know, savvy, sexy kind of cute housewife that, you know, we depicted with like oranges and, and bright colors and stonework and wallpapers that are grass cloth. And she was very hip and cool. And everybody kind of wanted to be her. On the flip side, you have Betty who, you know, I wanted to portray her house a little bit more um, tracked 70s house, more Sears catalog. It was important to her to kind of have those like nuances of like religious artifacts in the house. We even had like a home sweet home above the laundry room. So there's a <laughs> lot of like irony that way. And again, it's like a house that anybody would have, but if you looked closely, you see it's a bit messier. It's a bit darker, it's a bit lonelier, and you could see that, you know, the messiness is contributed by her depression. Like, she was depressed. Yeah. She had postpartum part of the time. They were both, like, not happy people, but if you walked into their houses for the most part, you'd be like, this is so normal and cool. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to tell with wood paneling, like, who's happy and who's not, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's true. Yeah. I had this visceral reaction, having grown up in the 70s and the early 80s, to the bedspreads of these hotels. And it's almost like an expression of quality of hotel based on the fabric of the bedspread. Help me understand, how do these places exist in real life? What did you have to create these things? And where do you source a wholly unnatural looking bedspread for these hotels? 
<laughs> you know, those were actually some of the hardest things to find still. They don't really have these roadside hotels anymore. Yes. And so we were so excited to find that Como like exterior that we found. We thought like this is just it. And then the room we did um, on stage or in our warehouse, we okay. built that. Uh -huh. There was just no way that, you know, any of these spaces would have been big enough to film in. And, you know, they in real life, you kind of didn't even really want to touch anything when you went into these rooms. <laughs> we just wanted to give the appearance that you didn't want to sit on the bedspread. We didn't want to actually like have everybody feel uncomfortable. Well, Jesse Plemons' character, you know, Alan Gore, he points to this red velvet bedspread as a way to sort of like as as emblematic of how they've kind of taken it a step down from one hotel to the next. I love that Candy decided that you needed to take it a step down just for the, I don't know, the challenge of it all or the adventure. <laughs> I'm not sure, but well, always to save what, go $3 yeah, or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that the coma became <clears throat> theirs. But, you know, I have to tell you, my decorator in Texas, Gabby Villarreal, she found the craziest stuff, and it really summed up the 70s to us. Like, we had real 70s stuff. I mean, it was magical kind of how we found everything. And she said one of her greatest sources was um, that Facebook marketplace. Oh. And people were always getting rid of all this crazy stuff from that time period. I mean, you know, having grown up, being a kid in that time period, and same with Gabby, we're both, like, not the biggest fans of the 70s. Yep, yep. Um, but there are people that just love it. And so we were able to procure a lot of the stuff. And I think the hardest thing to find for us in material wise was tile mm -hmm. and carpet. Just, you know, younger generations don't know the feeling of an orange, orange shag rug betwixt the toes, you know? <laughs> exactly. Like that was, and then even the new shags, because that did make a comeback, um, were not the same anymore. It's just not the same looking, you know, there was kind of a thickness to the old ones that was a little bit cooler. So I, 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 again, like it's a, I, the, it's a level of detail that I think when people think of like, oh, a period piece you know we're looking at some shows that are that pristine mid-century you're in this transition of late 70s to early 80s which is important for women which is important for their interior spaces and so when you're thinking about those details it's like are you having conversations about no candy wouldn't have that she would have that refrigerator but betty wouldn't you know? Absolutely. Like, as I said, so she's the cutting edge, right? She'll, she'll have the Sub-Zero. She'll have all the little cute TVs. She'll have those great, you know, dial phones or the push-button phones that are mounted on the wall back in the time period with the long cords. Um, <laughs> Betty, on the other hand, is not, you know, into the house the way every or the way Candy would be. She orders from a catalog. Her idea of style is that everything matches, right? And back in the day, like, you had bathroom sets, you know, you even had a cover on your toilet lid. You had the rug in front of the toilet that all matched. Betty's basic aesthetic is that it's hand-me-downs and it's definitely Sears. Yeah. You know, back then, the people didn't waste things. You didn't just, like, buy something new because it, you didn't like it anymore. It's like it lasts. So I felt like some of the furniture they brought with them were from the farm or from her family. And it was more about, you know, like, saving money. And so I made her furniture kind of the heavier, darker, kind of claustrophobic vibe of more the 70s. You know, Candy was starting to turn to the late 70s and to the 80s and, mm -hmm. and be interested in that kind of stuff more than Betty. I was wondering, you know, I think part of the challenges these days, especially with real estate in the way that it is, is trying to find places that still exist from the 60s and 70s. So tell me a little bit about Texas and in these, some of these small towns and some of the, the gems that you discovered while you were there. You know, we talked about that all the time. Like in L.A., everybody just tears everything down. And mm -hmm. it's a shame because you're losing all that. But in Texas, they don't. And so how many locations overall are Wiley and its surrounding areas? Like how many towns would did that take to aggregate in order to create one small town? I would say three, three different areas. But the tricky part there was um, there was so much like... Uh, it's hard to break apart. Like, you know, we use different towns and different shops and different facades for different things. And right now, like in my head, there was like over, I want to say if you really figured it out, 150 sets like and locations. So what were some of the things that you were thinking about of like, OK, we're not just in a little small town time capsule. We're in a character who's going through. She's searching. She's experiencing growth at this really interesting time. 
Well, I think that's reflected in the home itself, that she's so cutting edge on everything. And she um, she reads a lot of those romance novels. And they reference that. And I think Gabby even told me she had, you know, and I don't know that anybody will ever know that, but she had a um, the romance novel and then like an old massage device in her uh, drawers by for, her For bed. shoulders, of course. For shoulders, know. of course. Exactly. <laughs> she had it in her nightstand, you know, in her bedroom. And <laughs> that's a medical device, you know. Yeah, it's a medical it. device. Exactly. <laughs> and I think it's so funny that Gabby had put that there. I don't know if anybody will ever see it, but it's funny. right? So so just so you know, for anyone watching the show in in. In Candy's un- in the unseen drawer of Candy's bedside, <laughs> there is a a women's relaxation medical device. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> she was that cutting edge. Good for Candy, right? Right. So, and just the way they dressed her, she was <clears throat> you know more on the forefront. You know, Betty's house felt sexually repressed, right? Yeah. You know, we put crosses up in the house, yeah. and there's like the marriage photos on the wall, and we even had the wedding cake topper in the shelves. So, it's just it's more you know what America used to be at that time period, a little bit repressed, you know, and mm-hmm. you kind of feel that in that house as opposed to candies. So when you go into your like your average person's house, are you basically like if I had you over for dinner, would you be like scanning everything to be like, oh, okay, absolutely. <laughs> My my other decorator and I, Ron Franco, we talk about that. We're like, oh my God, we go to people's houses and it's like research. Wow. It's just I, you know, you get this intuition that you're just like, the details are what make things real. And so studying people and seeing how they live, and you know, most people don't live like a magazine, right? You learn right. so much by being at people's houses. So so much of what happens with Betty and Candy, um, from their relationship to the what we'll see is the incident that, you know, uh, tears them apart, (laughs) um, happens in domestic spaces from the kitchen to, we we know that a laundry room will play a big part in what happens. Um, is there a a way that you look at this at that you're giving little hints or Easter eggs for somebody that we can enjoy as we go into episodes three, four, five, six, and seven, you know, for that, I mean, that we thought it was so funny that we put the home sweet home that was embroidered in that laundry room where she, where the incident does occur. Mm-hmm. For Candy in her house, like, I know Gabby liked to have fun with, like, witches and, like, you know, omens and, and, and forebo- foreboding kind of um, animals. And so she put owls throughout Candy. I saw, I was going to ask about the owl. There's an owl that looks like a little lamp with the holes in it or like a There's a bunch holder. of owls in that and, whole set. And, yeah. And I was like, oh, that's so, like, was that a hip touch because owls were really big then and then they made a comeback Both. or what? Okay. Both. She was like, you know, they were totally in style at that time period. But they're also like in some cultures, I think like the Mexican culture basically that you see one and it's like that death is coming. Are there things that happen that you guys talk about to make sure that these are real people? It did really happen. This is a drama based on those events, so you have some creative latitude. But what about the ethical latitude? You know, I believe strongly in that. You basically want to portray it, you know, in a sense that you think is correct, but you don't need to, like, make it gory or disgusting. And I know that Leslie was very careful about that. It's strange, but, like, this show is about life and about these two people and who they were before this incident happened. Mm -hmm. So I feel like... That's an important to think about, like being respectful to these people. I mean, again, like I wanted people to walk into Betty's house and feel like, oh, my God, this is how she feels. It feels tighter. The ceilings are lower. It's cooler greens and blues. And it's kind of, you know, a little bit repressive. Um, And you want to walk into candies and be like, this is light and airy. But, you know, is it like such a large scale and you're kind of lost in your house vacuuming by yourself? Well, in the in the final scene of episode two, we've got Candy, who's perfectly framed by these uh, curtains. That's, you know, it's like a perfectly symmetrical shot, which I guess is in part a director's choice. Yes. But it's also you're something that you're thinking about, too, is that her life is symmetrical, p- perfect, you know, nothing out, she's nothing that, off center. She's the happy homemaker, right? Mm-hmm. So it had to be perfect in there. Her house never really had anything out of place, if you notice, right? She was always... So I love those proscenium shots when the director chooses to kind of frame an overall look. That's why I always like... Um, proscenium? Is that is that the word for it? Proscenium is kind of like in front of the, the screen, you usually have like a frame built around it and you shoot inside that so it looks like it's like a perfect locked off box. Mm-hmm. Like looking into a diorama, right. basically. Right. So 
So there are a lot of period shows now, especially in the late 70s and 80s, especially in crime dramas. Like, are we, is this, is this a supply that's going to dry up? Is there going to be a kitsch drought of things from the 70s and early 80s that you're hard to find now? I, I actually worry about that. Do you really? <laughs> I always think about that. I'm like, you know, it's such a shame. Like, it's getting harder and harder to find. But I feel like eventually, you know, people resell it again. Like, a lot of people bought it and will probably hold on to it and it'll resell. I feel like it's always going to be something that's going to probably circle through. But I know that at some point it's going to come a time where you have to build all these facades and everything because you're not going to find a lot of that 70s interiors and exteriors and walk into houses that are like complete time capsules. It's just too many like uh, decor shows now. Like everybody is an expert and everybody is redoing everything. And I feel like, you know, that started kind of down in Texas. So this is a very Texas show, right? Like, are there special things about Texas that you like picked up spending nine months down there that for the rest of us who who don't live there, who aren't as familiar, um, that would find like interesting or culturally unique? You know, I find it's like a huge pride. Like here in California, you don't like have flags everywhere and not everything has the California bear on it. But I felt like everything in Texas has that Lone Star. And, you know, even into the show back in the time period, we put in a lot of ashtrays and all that kind of crazy stuff that, you know, ashtrays, another thing that's long gone. (laughs) We had a whole collection of those, but um, you're kind of like... Wow, there's like everything has that Lone Star on it. It's true. I always know someone's from Texas. Oh, my God. They'll tell you the first sentence. An enormous sense of pride from a huge state where a lot happens, and we see a lot of it in this series. Thank you so much, Suzuki, for your time and for your expertise in sharing all of these details. I am so so impressed with all of the work that you did on this show. And we're only in episode two. There are so many other things to see and details to look out for. Yes, definitely. The first rule of real estate, location, 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 also held true for the series producers who searched all over Texas for a house perfect enough for the Montgomery's. It just so happened that the Austin residents of Texas Monthly writer-at-large, Sean O'Neill, had the it factor they were looking for. For this episode's Only in Texas, Sean shares what it's like to have your house become a part of true crime history. Sean O'Neill, writer at large for Texas Monthly. Thank you so much for joining us on the Love and Death podcast. Of course. Thanks for having me. So what was it about your place that had the it factor that HBO Max was looking for? Uh, it's slightly yuppie-ish. You know, I, I did some research and looked at the description of our of uh, Candy Montgomery's house, and it talked about how, you know, in Wiley, these are people who sort of left the Silicon prairie area to to build their dream homes. And so a lot of money got poured into these um, subdivisions that were erected out of nothing. And so when they built the Montgomery home, it was sort of this ski lodge place with kind of high peaked ceilings and um, these big open windows and, you know, wood beams. And um, our house does have some of those qualities. We have the some very large windows in the front of our house. It comes to a, a sort of crest at the top, the, I suppose you could call sort of like a ski chalet yeah. sort of look. Mm-hmm. I think they bought the land in like the, the mid-70s and they built their dream home on it. How does that compare to with, with your family? Was it your dream home? Um, the house, our house was built in 1969. It was owned by the the man who built it, who was one of the first to sort of establish a home in that neighborhood, uh, he sold it almost two years, uh, almost exactly two years later to the people we bought it from. The people we bought it from had lived there from 1971 until 2019. They'd raised their own two daughters in that house. He put all of his personal sweat equity into that house. So you're going to have a crew come in and return it back to a, a, an early 70s time period. So let's talk about that. You write about that beautifully in the uh, issue of Texas Monthly. Yeah, well, thank you. I, um, it's funny because it's time traveling to a fairly recent past because the people we bought it from had not done much updating at all. So there was still a lot of that 70s quality to it when we bought it. Um so it was kind of funny to see all the money that we had spent having it 
brought into the future completely wiped out by how in like a day in a day they had returned it back to how it was so you go to the house i think over a period of time and, and you're expecting this to be kind of an exciting experience right and there's going to be elizabeth olsen's there and she's a big star and whatnot um and then what actually happens is really amusing. Can you just walk me through the arc of the thrill of the Hollywood production to the the reality of the, I guess, the months that it might take to execute on this uh, the vision of the series? Yeah, the the build up to the production was you know at least a couple of months of coming over and constantly taking measurements and you know can we tear this out <laughs> can we you know a lot of negotiating of things that can 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 they take something away from our house and you know possibly not return it for 9 months or whatever um so once that was all done and the house itself had been uh, dressed to look like you know 1977 or whatever um the actual shooting was very brief it was a, it was only you know 6 days total so it went from just sort of this kind of long arduous um wait of you know seeing our house be slowly torn apart and re- reconfigured to all of a sudden one morning Elizabeth Olsen, Jesse Plemons, Lily Ray, Patrick Fugit, Leslie Lincoln, Gladder are all standing on my front lawn ready to shoot i mean they just showed up in a bus and they're ready um so that was exciting. Um, that was very exciting to suddenly see the actual movie stars right there in my living room. Um, most of the things that were filmed at my house were sort of these banal suburban scenes. This is where Candy Montgomery's life happened. It's before the death. And so this is where sort of the happy moments and their relationships took place. And I, it was mostly sort of these idyllic domestic scenes of like her doing laundry and she walked up and down my stairs with a laundry basket for about an hour and a half and um, they played with their kids in the in the lawn they tossed har- horseshoes and um, you know played on the swing set and they had a backyard barbecue and a baby shower and all these sort of lovely things that had um, that sort of set the tone for the the dramatic shift that happens I, I suppose later in the series you know a person might say, surreal but you actually make a really specific point in your piece it's hyper real it's not actually the montgomery's house but it is now the true story of candy montgomery in her house can you talk about how you articulate that in the piece um it all does stem from this pain that um is at the root of this story if that tragedy had never happened I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. I wouldn't have my own story to tell. So it's this weird thread that we're part of now that's been, you know, unspooling for 40 years. And I certainly had no personal connection to Candy Montgomery. I had no, um, I was two years old when this happened. I I had no part in the story. But now in a very tangential, but also very real or hyper real way, I, I am part of the story um but to get back to the fun stuff did you keep did you get to keep the wood paneling like what like what did you keep what 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 stayed from the 70s the wood paneling was already there believe it or not (laughs) Uh, that's what i said we we had preserved the 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 wood was very we we respect wood so we we left the wood um we actually were able to keep two of the corn plants that they installed uh they uh put those in downstairs just sort of for set dressing. And um, we asked them if we could just keep them and we named them the Montgomery's. Oh, really? And <laughs> <laughs> So you have candy corn, you have candy corn and pack corn. We okay. Can- we just call them the Montgomery's and they're barely, they're barely alive right now, but we're, we're trying really hard to keep them alive. So, <laughs> um, Sean, thank you so much for joining us on the love and death podcast and for sharing your perspective the only, you know, the person who is literally closest to the Montgomery family uh, in, in real life. Oh, thank you. I hope you enjoyed episode two of the official Love and Death podcast. In our next episode, we're going to spend some time with Kristen Ritter, who plays one of Candy's closest friends, which isn't easy as Candy's behavior escalates. Don't miss the next episode of the podcast out April 29th. See you then. The official Love and Death podcast is an HBO Max production in partnership with Texas Monthly Studio. 
the in-house agency for Texas Monthly. Our executive producers are Maddie Builder and Aaron Kabatsky. The podcast is written, produced, and hosted by me, Nancy Miller. Brian Standifer is our audio engineer, editor, and mixer. Music is courtesy of Warner Media, HBO Max, and Brian Standifer. Watch Love and Death now on HBO Max.